literary world. Um, tonight, we're proud to welcome author Stephen Blush with American Hardcore, the second edition, The Tribal History. And um, tonight, we have a really fantastic panel of guests here. Um, Tony Cadena of Adolescence, Lisa Bancher of, front of Frontier Records, and Edward Culver, a fantastic photographer. So, without further ado, Stephen Blush. What's up, L.A.? Hey. Hey. Thanks for coming out. Um, a decade ago, I wrote a book called American Hardcore. Product plug. Uh, about the early 80s American hardcore punk scene. Um, I, like many of you, were lucky enough to uh, participate in the scene or to get to know about it. Um, five years uh, later, uh, Paul Rackman and I... Um, finished the documentary film American Hardcore that premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in 2006. And uh, I just want to say that uh, all the panelists we're going to be having are uh, were in the book or in the DVD, so, you know, props to them. Um, uh, through all these experiences of working on the book, plus all this new information that's on the internet and meeting people and networking, you know, I had just so much more to say, there was so much more information and you know, I drew a few new conclusions. You know, I'm a different person. I got some new ideas. And so I basically rewrote, rewrote the whole damn thing. You know, I started zero. There's a hundred new pages. It was a real labor of love. Um, thank you so much to Book Soup for sponsoring this, for Rebecca, for Jennifer, to everyone for, for having us here and for their support. It really means a lot. And, you know, support your local independent bookstore. Um, Um, you know, so I've been traveling around the country promoting this second edition of the book. Uh, and on top of the usual just bookstore reading appearances, I've been doing and organizing these, and moderating these panel discussions, addressing the cultural impact of the hardcore scene. You know, not so much like when did it happen, but what was the impact of it. And, um, you know, this whole DIY subculture that we talked about that started 20, 20 plus years ago really kind of is, you know, makes its waves today. Um, a few months ago at the CMJ panel, at the CMJ convention, I assembled a, a panel, kind of a VIP panel of people to, to discuss how over the past 20, 30 years, virtually every major rock band that you know and like claims a hardcore past. Um, you know, Nirvana, Chili Peppers, Beastie Boys, Pearl Jam, Foo Fighters, Rage Against the Machine, on and on and on. They, they all go back to the hardcore scene. They've all got this hardcore roots. That's like the secret history of rock. You know, when you watch MTV or read a Rolling Stone article, they're not telling you this. You know, so it's really important for me to kind of step out and say that. Um, at the Strand in New York City, I uh, did a panel discussing the legacy of New York hardcore. So tonight here at Book Soup, uh, we'll show how this hardcore punk scene that was literally born of Southern California alienation changed the look and feel of modern rock, right? The scene that started 30 years ago is really what bands looked like and kids looked like, and you know, so it's a very heavy thing. Um, you know, here on the Sunset Strip, we all know about pop culture, and we don't know about media and pop culture, and superstars and millionaires and beautiful people. But festering underneath the cracks of this utopia was born this vast, in this vast suburban cultural wasteland grew up a, a punk subculture we now know as hardcore, hardcore punk. Um, now everybody uses the term hardcore, uh, but back in the day it was a bad word. It was a term you used for, for pornography and something you used for this awful music. And that's, you know, pretty much what it was. Uh, and this intense early 80s LA subculture, uh, as like I said, it casts a vast shadow on today's modern culture. It literally changed the look and feel of rock and pop culture. People today, you know, they don't look at the megastars of 1980 who sold a zillion records. You know, what was that like? Van Halen and Fleetwood Mac and Styx and Journey. You know, bands don't look like that. They don't sound like that. You know, the kids of today talk of and emulate the bands that sold a few thousand records. They talk about the bands that these panelists were in 
or the, the ones that they were into back in the day. Uh, previously unimaginable anti-establishment bans, not from the Sunset Strip, but from Orange County and Southland and Inland Empire, their tours of the heartland during the Reagan years would forever change the way bands played and the way, the way things went down. Um, hardcore's new radical so, um, crowd behavior, slam dancing, stage diving, crowd surfing, with its roots born of Pacific Ocean waves and backyard diving boards forever altered the live rock experience. You know, it's no longer just flicking lighters and playing air guitar. It was something much, deep, much heavier than that. Um, <clears throat> L.A. hardcore pioneers like the Adolescents and Black Flag and Circle Jerks and Social D, um, their songs today read to kids today like the Stones and Led Zeppelin did to kids, you know, when I was coming up. And that's very deep. You know, you go to a bar, everyone knows the words of those Misfits songs. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, you know, this is this has really made its inroads. And, you know, gnarly punked out skaters from Venice and West L.A. hanging out at the Black Flag and TSOL shows. That paved the way for all that, like, Warp Tour and X Games. and You know, that's, that's really where this all comes out. So, again, we're not talking about, like, what happened when 50 kids showed up in a room and sold, and the band sold a thousand records. We're talking about, like, the power of a movement. And, you know, the whole pop-punk thing, the whole thing spearheaded by Green Day and The Offspring, you know, these bands should be paying royalties to the adolescents and the descendants and all that. You know? Straight up. Um, you know, the whole mall punk hot topic culture, that was an unintended consequence of hardcore. That's what happens when the industry got its hooks into it. Um, 70s LA punk labels like Danger House and Posh Boy, it opened the doors for so many other labels, you know, Lisa Fancher's uh, Frontier Records, super important. You know, then there was Black Flag's label SST, and that inspired all the other bands to start their labels. Uh, Youth Brigade started BYO, and, you know, of course, Bad Religion started Epitaph, so... It was really like this hands-on experience that this DIY and this DIY approach of these labels is now a, a key part of the modern indie rock business model. This is how you put out records. You put it out like how these bands did 30 years ago. Um, as a musical historians, I figured out a few things. Mostly, um, you know, other historians have documented how the beatniks, the hippies, the punks, hip hop, they're all part of this post-World War II subcultures that changed the world, and I think we need to add American hardcore into that continuum of youth rebellion. Um, it's also clear to me that hardcore is a total Southern California art form. You know, even the DC bands will tell you they learned it from their trips to, to out here. And that, um, and that this Southern California art form, born of suburban angst and alienation, Despite what the critics of the day thought, or how marginalized it, it still is, hardcore is a legitimate art form, and should be treated as such. Um, on a side note, I've kind of done my best to archive all this. Um, I have a website called AmericanHardcoreBook.com, and on it I have something called 24 Hours of Hardcore, which is a 24-hour playlist of 911 songs of you know, some of the most obscure, cool hardcore you could find. So I advise you to find that out. It, also includes so many cool Southern California bands that you'll, you'll want to see. Um, I guess what I'm saying is that so much of what we take for granted in music and pop culture today was born off the backs of gnarly hardcore kids. And that whole mindset, subculture, <laughs> and musical form started spontaneously right here. So, uh, L.A., give yourself props. Um, I was told to break this down into a who, what, where, why, how. Um, the who, I guess that would be like the L.A. hardcore scene participants. You know, we talk about, what are we going to be talking about? You know, who starred in your Penelope Spheris films? You know, who was on the Rodney Rock, on the Rock compilations? Who did you read about in Flipside? You know, what, what bands was Edward Culver taking care, you know, photos of? You know, that's what, that's what the whole panorama of the scene is. Um, there's the what, you know, like what went down, Oaky Dogs, the Fleetwood, the Cuckoo's Nest, the Cathay de Grand, you know, on and on. You know, you know, the Olympic Auditorium, so we're kind of paying respect to that. 
Um, the wear is, you know, like we're hardcore spread from like the bowels of Orange County all the way to the valley and Nardcore and Oxnard and but most most importantly it's you know how it spread nationally. It went viral in the truest sense of the word. We talk about viral. This was a virus thing that took down rock music. And uh, the why, I guess, is like uh, why this kind of wrecking crew of new breed of monster came out of the tranquil burbs. Like, what was it that made this whole thing start? You know, coming from the beach towns and the suburbs. And the how is how will a hardcore change the world, which is the name of our panel. So before I introduce the panelists, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a reading. Not much. Keep it very spare. You're going to need the glasses for it. Um, first, I just, you know, this is just kind of a statement of purpose uh, from the intro. I have two intros to the second edition of the book. I run the uh, first um, the, the first edition from 2001. I have that intro, and I also have the intro from the, the new issue. Um, I'm documenting the American hardcore punk scene because it's being forgotten. Its history is evaporating as the participants die off or find religion or repress their memories of those dynamic days. This book addresses the peak years of American hardcore, 1980 through 86. Much happened in that short time. Hardcore was more than music. It became a political and social movement as well. The participants can constituted a tribe unto themselves. Some of them were alienated and abused and found escape in the hard edge music. Some of them sought a better world or tearing down the status quo and were angry. Most of them simply wanted to raise hell. Stark and uncompromising, hardcore generated a lifestyle stripped down to the bare bones. Its intensity exposed raw nerves. Everyone was edgy and aggressive. Like most revolutionary art and original thought, hardcore clashed with mainstream society and generated resistance. As a minor subculture, it received a little, little attention and commanded even little respect. Hipsters took one look at the adolescent violence and dismissed the whole thing. Lots of fucked up kids found themselves through hardcore. Many people say things like, I grew up thinking I was such a weirdo, but I met like-minded people and figured out that I wasn't such a freak after all. So if that's what hardcore did for them, then the scene was a successful. For some, it served as a valuable social network. For others, it opened a rich musicological mind. But for all involved, hardcore was a way of life, something you had to do. Right? So that's the point I'm, I'm trying to make here. Um, har American hardcore, generally unheralded at the time, gave birth to much of the music and culture that followed. Original fans should feel vindicated. No one gives a damn about which arena act sold 10 zillion records in 1983. Hardcore heroes like Black Flag, Dead Kennedys, Bad Brains, Minor Threat are modern immortals. Immortals. At the time of this writing, few successful rock artists are not subject to a tinge of hardcore. So, you know, that's what I was saying 10 years ago. And I think a lot of that really does hold true. So, in my new intro, I just kind of say, um, uh, here's the second edition of American Hardcore, the book that set the record straight on American Hardcore punk music. It opened the doors to a decade of discussion and debate. I'm proud to have been the one who stepped up and documented it all and took the heat for it, and I'm humbled by the attention and appreciation. Um, and I conclude it by saying, the most valuable thing I've learned from this whole wild ride is that no matter what you do or how the hell you do it, it all comes down to integrity. Um, despite all the flaws and misgivings, hardcore bands, when compared to virtually every other entity in popular music, ooze with a relentless realness that reads as refreshing and respect-worthy to today's adult kids. In so many ways, our world has drastically improved since the chaotic Reagan days of American hardcore. In other ways, 30 years removed from the original hardcore explosion, we're sadly back to where we started in 1980. Consider this American Hardcore second edition a 400-page blueprint for new century cultural revolution. What you do with the seditious data herein is totally up to you. So, with that note, I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, afterwards, we're going to be doing a signing of the book uh, back here. Yes. Buy the book back there. Sign it over there. Is that correct? Yes. All right. We got this down.
that's how it's going to work. Um, we have real great panelists today. I want to thank them all for coming out. I want to start with Lisa Fancher. Here. Here for Lisa. You know, Lisa started Frontier Records, which really launched the hardcore with adolescents and circle jerks and suicidal. And then she went on to pioneer the rise of alternative rock with Thin White Rope and Naked Prey and all that great, all that, late, stuff. All that great late '80s yeah. stuff. So, so it's really, you know, you know, you talk about DIY. This is really where it started. You know, so let's hear for Lisa. Yeah. Uh, next, uh, very important, great friend of mine, person I really respect, I respect them all of course, I don't want to put any balance in this, but I want to introduce Edward Culver. Um, Edward, was, Edward was definitely the definitive LA punk and hardcore photographer and is probably my favorite photographer. Um, in New York rock, you know, we have Bob Gruen, and for LA punk, it's Edward Culver. It seems like he shot every iconic image and band photo back in the day, and I'd urge you all to check out his book, Light at the End of the Funnel, and his great t-shirt line. So let's hear it for Edward. And, um, I don't know this guy. Um, Tony Reflex, we call him sometimes. I call him Tony Cadena, a.k.a. Mr. B. Uh, singer of the Adolescents and so many other cool groups. He had the Abandoned and Flower Leopards and Sister Goddamn in the ads. And is one of my favorite singers, and it really means a lot for him to participate. So let's hear it for Tony. And, and I want to apologize. Uh, Keith Morris cannot make it. He is under the weather. He sends his regards. Uh, Upset not to have him, really. But uh, I think we could we could handle this. So um, with that, we'll start this. Uh, let me move things to the side and we'll get going. Um, Is that enough? Yeah, that's enough for me. It's enough for me. All right. So basically the way it's going to go is I'm going to throw a few questions to these guys. We're going to, in particular, and then we're going to, you know, talk about a few, we're going to throw around a few questions, and uh, if you have any questions, we'll take it from you, and then we'll do a little book signing. Um, I want to start with Lisa. Um, talk about... Oh. You know, when you started Frontier, I mean, I just wanted you to kind of talk about the obstacles and the challenges for putting out these L.A. bands and getting the records to attention, because there really was nothing to start with. Um, at the time, Slash Magazine, uh, Slash Magazine and Slash Records, so there was that. And I think, uh, I think Robbie had some records out, right? And uh, so when I put out the Flyboys, there was hardly any competition at all. And luckily for me, the adolescents and the Circle Jerks had already worked with Robbie and didn't like him, so I went with them by default. <laughs> so that worked out well. And there was really no avenues that there was. You know, even a couple years later, there was no college radio. There was hardly any press. A couple fanzines, flip side, of course. And um, the obstacles was that there was, no, there was no infrastructure at all, so it was built it, you know, played the clubs until they got closed down by kids that didn't behave well. Uh, things like that, so um, played the cuckoo's nest till we couldn't play there anymore, and so you just kept moving around and get, get the scene going. But the obstacles, not having money, and then not getting paid, and just trying to move forward and keep signing bands, for me anyway, I had a different set of issues than bands did. And talk about, like, this was not, like, uh, this was, there was no network. There was no, like, you know, like, oh, I'm going to, like, get it. Tons of stuff on the radio all around the country. And no, thinking. obviously it was like it was completely different. Is this even on or working? No, it's not. Yeah. Okay. No, um, just, just hold it on. <laughs> um, I know I do. I'm trying to think. There was like college radio even in those days. I didn't do college radio mailouts. Uh, maybe a couple of fanzines. So 
it was very few and very spread out. Bands didn't even tour. We didn't even the adolescents didn't even tour when the first record came out for a while because there really wasn't a typical club scene. We so, didn't even know how to. No, there was no idea. There wasn't somebody that did that kind of thing. Unless you were a real, real band, there was no. So people just figured it out, and it was just like a sort of network of fans. And uh, obviously, things are infinitely easier now. You can just go look up everything, but you just had to figure it out for yourself. Um, great. Uh, now uh, I want Google Punk too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do I go on tour dot com? Yeah. And um, you know, one of the first records, I guess, really to be played on radio of this kind of music, certainly K-Rock and all, all that was Adolescence Amoeba, right? Is that, is yeah, that it's not my like? version, alas. Right. But um, definitely it was a huge hit. That was like actually a real, real hit. Uh, Tony, do you want to kind of talk about that? I mean, because that, uh, that kind of instantly affected your life, I'm sure, you know, also yeah. on the radio. Yes, it was It was uh, very, very, very quick and <laughs> very spontaneous, everything was. And as Lisa was sharing, there wasn't a, we didn't have a structure, so if you wanted your records in a store. Sometimes you dropped them off at the store. And if you wanted to, if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to, uh, uh, if you wanted to collect your money, you had to go and pick up the money. And if you wanted to, uh, uh, if somebody went out of business, and somebody always did, because this, this, this is how networks worked, um, then there were, then you lost you lost whatever that that investment was. And so there were, you know, there were episodes of, of breaking into cars when somebody didn't pay us and taking <laughs> our records back or, um, you know, and, and there, you know, it, to us, it, these weren't acts of, of uh, anything, but they, they belonged to us. So we didn't see it as being crime. We saw it as being our, our, our right. Um, when things started to get it played on the radio, it was it did it happened very very quickly, and we uh, didn't know what to uh, we didn't know what to make of it. Um, we could play a lot of clubs, but then there were a lot of clubs that we couldn't play because I had gotten myself into a lot of trouble with the with the staff at, at most of the clubs here. I wasn't allowed to play at any of the clubs on the strip. I wasn't allowed to play at the Starwood anymore, and we started to play in East Los Angeles because. There was nothing that I could do there that hadn't already been done. So, <laughs> you know, um, and there, it, it, we had a very strong uh, fan base there in East Los Angeles. So we we stayed there. We actually, started playing playing east and downtown and playing in the east. And um, the um, um, the so the radio while while getting the play, it didn't it didn't change um, our accessibility. We still didn't know how to tour. We could we could call people if we stole someone's credit card number, or we could um, you know just to, to, to you know to, to sit there making 15, 20 phone calls to somebody to, to try to book a club, but that was that was all we had. We could play here, we could play in Los Angeles, and that was I mean in San Francisco, and that was about it. Can you uh, can you talk about how people responded to your band at first? Because you're kind of like you know you're the bullhorn about that. you know you're like the first group out there kind of one of the first groups out there and people did not uh despite how people love to go to a mosh pit these days i mean it was not exactly an easy thing to do at first and people the reception was kind of harsh at first right yes it, yes it was we had we had a, um, a rough time actually lisa when she came to she came out to see us a couple of times um to you know because she was interested in the band but we were we were playing in living rooms so you know we couldn't play clubs. There were there weren't very many clubs that we had left that we could play, and um, so when she was going to come out to see us, she came to, she you know we, we called her and said there's no point in coming out anymore because by the time we had, we had actually started to play, um, we'd you know gotten into fights that were so so significant that you know whole blocks were getting shut down and there and there were brawls you know in the middle of our little you know beautiful little garden grove and. Anaheim neighborhoods. There were, you know, 200 kids, you know, fight, you know, you know, you know, literally having fist fights in the street. So because we would go and play, somebody would pick me up and throw me on top of the drum kit who lived in the neighborhood who didn't like the music that we were playing. So they just walk into the party, you know, beat the band up, and then it would, st it would turn into this big, you know, it would turn into a free for all because by the time everyone made it to the party to see us play. We were already, you know, we were already, 
you know, in, embroiled in, 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 in a fight. So, you know, it, it turned into a big mess where we ended up not being able to play at all. That's great. Um, I want to turn to Edward now, like, you know, the guy who was really capturing this whole scene. Uh, and I guess, Edward, what I want to ask you is, what were you seeing in the scene in this, you know, I guess you talk about 78 to 83 maybe or something like that, but what, what was it that you were seeing in this time that was getting you so excited to, to want to shoot this stuff? <laughs> well, there was definitely uh, an energy, and uh, you know, it was new. It was, you know, something was seriously going on. It was like you know, you could feel it. I took my sister to see the Dead Kennedys in 1979, and she was kind of terrified in the balcony at the whiskey. Thought she'd be in a riot within a couple of minutes or something, you know, because of the chaos that was going on. And, you know, things like that. Yeah. It was fun. You, but you were around in the, you know, the late 60s and 70s. You saw this whole rock thing. Like, how was this different? This was something different going on. Or, or maybe there was something, to, maybe there was a similarity between some of these musics that fans you were following, too. I don't know about that, but yeah, I saw all kinds of stuff in the 60s. And, you know, there, was like a, there was a whole other underground scene, kind of. Mm -hmm. And I liked that about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I worked with a lot of these bands. I did their first albums and stuff, and it's like, you know, and worked with all kinds of people. Lisa put out the first album I did the cover for, the Circle Jerks Group Six. I shot some of the pictures across the street right here in Larrabee where, mm -hmm. where uh, Lucky lived when he was studying law. They were a block away from the whiskey and we took pictures in their house. And uh, I did some of them on stage and then we uh, shot pictures of them at the Marina Del Rey Skate Park. Oh, you've got it right there. The originals. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of damaged. Yeah. Well, they've, they've gone through a few. But he does have the free barcode ones. So. Uh, I don't know. I saw all kinds of bands in the 60s, like the Mothers in 1966, and, you know, a bunch of different bands. And Captain B. Park. Was this a different energy? I mean, obviously it was a different time, but was it a different... Yeah, was there a, yeah, it, was, yeah well, it was definitely different in energy. Do you, it wasn't anything to do with any of the uh, stuff that was going on in the 70s. See, I used to go out when I was a kid to shows all the time between the like mid-60s and then the early 70s. And in the 70s, it's like I didn't go anywhere. You know, I didn't see anything. And then this all started up. It's like I'm in. You know, it was all over. It was fine. Mm -hmm. I, I actually, I, I shot the hardcore scene from late 78 